So here we just have cakes and they disappear. Okay. So Jennifer talked to you about one approach to graph convergence, which is to some extent near to statistical physics. So where we say we probe a large dense graph by looking at homomorphisms either from the left, which are the subgraph sequences, or from the right, which con corresponds to convergence of all possible st finite state statistical nearest neighbor models on that sequence of graphs, okay? So, <clears throat> and we wanted to prove their equivalent and we introduced a metric which Jennifer did for you and then you can prove the equivalent. It's a lot of work, but that is this approach. And once you have these notions of convergence, you can ask what the limit is. Lazzi and Balash Zagetti came up with that. And these graph ones are not only limits of sequences, but you can also use them to generate random graphs, as Jennifer showed you, and that actually goes back to the statistics community, Aldous and Hoover, in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, now, I want to have a very different idea about graph convergence, okay? So, let's assume you have this large graph, in general, it could be some arbitrary geometric structure, a combinatorial structure. It could be a sequence of numbers, it could be permutations, it could, so you have this large structure and you want to define some kind of limit. But assume you don't have really access to it, it's really huge. So instead you have some sampling procedure which gives you a small object. Um, so for example, you could imagine this benjamini schramm convergence where I just take a random point there in the middle and then I look at a ball of radius k and I output the induced subgraph on that. Okay, and then you have a parameter k here which I swipe under the rug, but you will then want that. And then you define this thing here to be convergent. If this, so this is now a random object if this converges in distribution. Okay, so you say this thing converges to whatever we know. We don't, I mean, whatever this might be, if these converge in distribution. And then the limit is obviously very simple. It's a probability distribution over these finite objects. And now if you're lucky, you might have a lot of symmetry and then actually there is a nicer representation for these probability distributions. So let me walk you through that for, for dense graphs, how we would do that here. Okay, so I will do this for dense graphs, then I will go to sparse graphs, introduce something called sampling convergence, then we'll come to these graph axes, and I will give you some examples, the so-called configuration model, and if I have time, I will in, in one slide represent 108 pages of proofs, okay? The final theorem. Okay, so, so Jennifer defined left convergence as asking that the probability that a random homomorphism uh, is a particular graph F converges. Well, this is sort of identical to what I define here. So I just say, okay, let's choose K vertices uniformly IID at random. Um, so this is your random map. And now Jennifer asked the probability that this is a homomorphism. I will ask the probability actually that you see a particular graph, which is sort of up to exclusion, inclusion, the same thing, okay? So I say that this large graph, I will test it by outputting the induced subgraph on these guys, so I get this random little object. And then I define the sequence of dense graphs to be left convergence if the distribution of these converge for all k. And you can actually, these are just, since this is a finite graph, it's given by k choose two frequencies, and you calculate those from the finite subgraph frequencies Jennifer defined by inclusion exclusion. Okay, so it's equivalent to Jennifer's definition, but it's sort of a different concept. And now, now you may ask yourself, what is the limit? And I don't want to yet go to the graph one. I want to say, well, very naturally, I would say, well, the limit is just a collection of probability distribution on finite graphs. 
And if you now look at this a little bit more precisely, you see it's, it's uh, projective. So if you look at the graph GK and you remove one vertex, then, well, then you just remove this vertex. The other ones are still chosen uniformly at random, so you get the object on K minus one vertices. So this is what's called a projective collection. And then by Kolmogorov, you can send K to infinity and you get an infinite random graph. Okay, so that is another answer. Okay, so the, the limit of a sequence of deterministic graphs is an infinite random graph, um, which I can describe by an infinite random matrix, which is this random array. Okay, and now comes the famous Aldous Hoover theorem. So before I write that down, um, I don't know. I don't know how many people, who has seen Definetti's theorem? Who's still the point you earn? So, so, so I will not write it on the board, I will just state it in words. In the simplest case, let's say we have a sequence of zero ones, an infinite sequence. I will call it exchangeable if the distribution is invariant under permutation. So if the distributions of x1, x2, blah, 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 is the same as the distribution of x3, x1, x2, blah, 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 for all possible permutation. Then it's called exchangeable. And now the Definetti theorem says that if a sequence is exchangeable and I condition on the sigma algebra at infinity, then actually it's just a sequence of independent coin flips. So there's independent coin flips, there must be some p, and what is this p? Well, the p is the asymptotic ratio of pluses and minuses, and, um, well, p over one minus p is the ratio. And, um, and so that has some distribution, which is the sigma algebra, is in the sigma algebra at infinity, and if I condition on that, I just have independent coins. And now you might think if I have a matrix which is exchangeable, so we will now get to that. Okay, so this matrix now turns out to be permutation invariant, right? So these labels were actually chosen originally as x1 up to xk uniformly at random. Well, IID, well, if I do a permutation of those, it's the same distribution, so the matrices will be the same too, so you have this invariance. It turns also out to be extremal, you can easily, you can just look how it's generated and on k times k, on n minus k and n minus k, well, they are just chosen independently, so they're independent, and that is the kind of factorization which is only compatible with the trivial sigma algebra at infinity, so it's extreme. Okay, so this is our answer to just reformulate it, so the limit of a left convergent sequence of dense graph is an extremely exchangeable array. And now you might say, well, maybe there's a definite here. So maybe I can just flip some coin P, and then I get a random graph with probability P, and that should be it. But that's actually not true, okay? So what is true is that if you condition on the sigma algebra at infinity, then there exists a random W, and since I will now here put extreme as a random W is not random anymore, but in general, you would get a probability distribution over Ws such that once condition on that, you get the following object. You just choose x1, x2, and so on uniformly at random in 0, 1, IID. And then you just choose the interest Aij, Bernoulli, with this probabilities given by W which is exactly the model Jennifer defined, okay? So that is the Aldous Hoover theorem. So the Aldous theorem is just the analog of Definetti for random infinite matrices. You should point out that it was Tim Austin and... Well, but we'll get to that. Um, so, so that's the Aldous Hoover theorem, and it's true in much more generality if this goes not into zero one, but in some nice Borel space, and it could be instead of sort of a two-dimensional, it could be a k-dimensional array, so it holds much more general, but this is the version we need here, because now we just apply this theorem to what we had before, and we get that the limit of a left convergent sequence can be, is given by this graph on which Jennifer defined for you, okay? So this is actually now a one-line proof, well, maybe three if you count the page before of this, Theorem by Lazzi and Bala, 
Belas, Balos, um, who uh, didn't know about the Aldous Hoover theorem at that time. And this was pointed out to us by Svante Janssen and uh, Percy Diaconis and Tim Austin independently realized that, that actually you could use the Aldous Hoover theorem to prove at least this existence of the W using Z. Okay? So, and this is sort of the symmetries I was talking about in this picture. So if you have enough symmetry, here this was this exchangeability, then you get this new representation in terms of the W. Okay, this the nodes I already discussed, so I will skip over them. Um, so now we would like to do the same thing for sparse graphs. If there were bounded degree or bounded average degrees, that would lead you very natural to benjamini schramm convergence. That's not what I'm going to do here. I will want to talk about graphs where the average degree is divergent, so I will give you a different sampling convergence sequence. So you should sort of think in, in this approach, you should just think, okay, if I want to define a limit, I have to find some sampling procedure which accesses this huge object in the cloud, returns me a small object, and then I define limits by probability distributions on those, and depending what the sampling procedure is, and what objects I'm talking in the cloud, I get various different notions of limits. Um, so what would we do? Let's try just the same as before. Okay, so if I try the same as before, the problem is an expected number of edges in here is, well, k times, so k choose two if I had just density one, if every edge were there, but I have to multiply by the edge density. And so, since this goes to zero for fixed k, this will always give the empty graph. Okay, so that's a nice limit, but not super interesting. Um, so how do we get around it? Well, we just define a sampling procedure such that in expectation, we let k grow with n, namely such that this object is of order one over rho, so that this rho cancels. So if you do that, okay, here's the definition. So I define Poisson sampling. So why do I call it this? So think just of a Poisson process of intensity k on the vertex set. Or formulated differently, choose k equals kappa times number of vertices. That would be the number of points you see in that Poisson process. And then just look on these Poisson points, look on the induced subgraph, so that would be this object remove all isolated vertices because we will be sparse. There will be a lot of isolated vertices. I have to add a lot of vertices before I start to see any edges. And so I have to try many times and then I throw all of them out. And so now if I choose this kappa correctly so that it cancels my, so I need this to be one over density and if you see what that means, this is the right kappa here, okay? So then you get the expected number of edges is equal to t squared over two, uniformly in the density. And that will now be my definition. So this is work with Henry Cohn. So all, well, if there, are, if there is only one B in the citation, that's me. If there are only one C, it's Jennifer. If there are two Cs, it's Henry Cohn. And Victor, in this case, is our, uh, was our intern at the time. So we introduced. Yeah, at yes, he said Columbia now. Uh, so we introduced this notion. We call this guy sampling convergence if for all t this object converges in distribution. And it's not that hard to convince yourself if we get subsequential convergent because, well, it's just a discrete, I mean, you have just finite discrete graphs, and this is sort of just discrete probabilities, and this space is just compact. So the set of probabilities distributions there is compact, so we get sort of subsequential convergent automatically. So the question is, what is the limit of this object now? And we'll do just the same as we did before. So first you would say, well, now we have a parameter t, which is continuous. So instead of a sequence, we have a process of unlabeled finite random graphs, okay? And the question is, is an analog of the Aldous Hoover theorem for this kind of processes, okay? And now a preliminary answer would be, 
Well, let's just do what Jennifer did, okay? So Jennifer did that, so let me jump to the next page. Okay, so I will actually put the, so the Jennifer already did that, right? So we say we have some finite, so some function which is mapped into zero one on some feature space, and then you choose your Poisson process, you connect i and j with probability w of x i x j, remove the isolated vertices, and you get this object, okay? And so then you would sort of, so the process would not now be described by. So when you say it's a finite graph, I don't get that. The, the uh, GT, right? The, the GT is finite because I had, so when, we, so when we have a finite graph, G, originally, right? So let me jump back. Is your question whether, so this guy, if G is finite, this is with probability one a finite graph, right? Because the Poisson process with probability one has finitely many points, and then I get an induced subgraph on that many points, so, so that's a fun. Also GN, or is this hmm? T is. There is a GN, then this definition No. Oh, there should be a yes. GN. You're yes. right. This is a GN. This is the thing. Okay. So, so this is. Um, and the expected number of edges is t squared over two. So with probability, there are not too many, right? There are not more than one million times t squared edges. So you can actually, so, and they trace two in the limit because that bound holds. So in other words, if I don't do this limit for each t, I get an almost surely finite graph gt because it has finitely many edges and therefore finitely many vertices because they removed the isolated vertices. So does that answer your question? Good. And now here, why is this object finite? Well, there's something I didn't say, but if, if W is integrable, then you can actually calculate the expected number of edges in this object and it turns out to be again t squared over two. Okay, and this was this example. Now, the question is, is this all? And the answer is no, okay? So, so now let me walk more systematically through and let's not make any guesses, okay? So this process is a process of unlabeled finite graphs. Now, I can also represent it as an extremal exchangeable random measure, okay? So let's be a little slow. We have the positive quadrant. We have measures of those. We can put some sigma algebra on it. I don't want to bore you with how you do that. Um, and then you can therefore define a random measure. And so, so I claim this. So why is this the case? So, so this one was defined by having a Poisson process on the vertex set. So now what instead I'm doing, I do a Poisson process on the vertex set cross R plus, and I put this rate on it. So now if instead of all of R plus, I now look at a strip of width T cross V of G, then this is sort of all Poisson points which have arrived up to time T, well, then the intensity becomes T over Z. So that will give you a coupling for all these Poisson processes, okay? And now what we can do, we can actually forget these vertex labels and only remember the time labels. There will be with probability one all different. So it's a nice way to, and if I do that, you have your random measure. Because now I will just put sort of a delta function. So if my vertices are now labeled by time ti and tj, I just put a delta function there in the positive quadrant. So this is actually a random, counting measure, actually very simple random count measure because the weights are just zero and one. Okay, and if you love these processes, you will know how to put sigma algebras on it and you will know how to matricize them and all this stuff. There's a lot of fun to be had. Or if you have a headset, you first learn it, which is also a lot of fun. And, and then you just take the limit um, and actually it's sort of not that hard to show that if if these uh, you were sampling convergence originally, that's the same as asking that these random measures converge in the suitable topology. Um, 
if you want to know it's a topology of vague convergence. Um, so what are the properties of this random measure? Well, it's exchangeable because remember we had forgotten the vertex label and only kept the time labels. So now assume I replace my interval zero t with something obtained by a measure preserving transformation. Let's say the interval two up to two plus t. That's a measure preserving transformation. And the Poisson process on the real axis part is invariant under these measure preserving transformations. So you see by constructions, we get sort of this measure preserving transformation stuff. And psi is extremal as before, it's sort of now you have a simplex of these exchangeable random measures and it turns out to be exchangeable for roughly the same reason, except that things get technically quite complicated because you have to deal with processes. Hmm? So now the question is, is there an analog of the aldous hoover theorem for random measures rather than random arrays? And the answer is yes. Okay, there's a theorem by Kallenberg from 99 and it talks about this thing, about exchangeable random measures, and it talks about, and it has just like the aldous hoover theorem had, it has conditions when they are um, extremal, when they are not, when these random measures are actually locally integrable, when they're not locally in, so there are a lot of nice conditions, some of them wrong in the original paper, but can be repaired. So, and if you use that, then what you get, you get in addition to the object Jennifer defined, so this graph on over a sigma finite space, you get another function, a star function, and finally a constant. So you get actually as a limit not a graph on, but what Roy and Weich call a graph x, which is this triple. And now you can use the triple to create a random graph as follows. So you do as before your Poisson process, you join two Poisson points with this probability as before. But now in addition for each of the Poisson points, you add sort of leaves of a star which have a degree Poisson t times z. And you independently add isolated edges at rate t squared times this parameter i. And then you remove all the isolated vertices you output the unlabeled graph, and if you label the vertices by their time, you get back the exchangeable random measure. And that is um, Kallenberg's theorem, and that's so, so this gives now this theorem, okay? So if Gn is sampling convergence to Gt, then there exists a graph x, which turns out norm smaller or equal than one, so that is the integral of the w, the integral of the s plus i, some of them multiplied by two, um, and that turns out to be smaller or equal than one, such that this limiting random process is actually given by the process I just defined. Can you say again how you wrote the star in this point? So, so I have my Poisson points, which sit somewhere in my space. Born, rich and intelligent. Well, well let me, so. So, so, so let, let me just do it on the board. You have the W of x, i, and x. So I have here my Poisson points in the plane. At time t, these have sort of, they're, they're infinitely many, but we only see the board, okay? So these have appeared, and now with probability w, you draw some, and the other ones are not connected. And now I have some function s of x, i. I multiply that by, so the Poisson points have density t in this plane, so this is a unit square, so they are roughly t squared, t squared many in here. And now, they have, and now, so I've said density t in one direction, if you want, and now I do, so now I add stars, so each of them will have expected degree of order t, and there is Poisson density t, so they're also order t squared many edges from the stars, and then I just choose isolated edges, which I just add to it, they don't have any feature vector, and they get put with intensity squared times i. The stars are adding new edges and new vertices to the, the stars, so maybe this Poisson post, okay. So here was, this was Jennifer, yeah. this was Anton, this was Chuck, and this was me, poor Christian, who actually was isolated before in Jennifer's thing. 
but I actually have a huge S of X, so I have a million students who want to work with me. All of you think I'm an idiot, so you don't want to work with me. Um, so the S of X can make a vertex have very high degree, even though maybe the W, even the integral over the second component may be very small. Okay, so and now the theorem says that whenever a sequence of graph is sampling convergent, then it must be given by this process. And you use this Kallenberg theorem, which essentially tells that exchange random measures are of that form, while Kallenberg is formulated in a more general setting, so he has actually, instead of three terms, seven terms, and his matrix doesn't have to be symmetric, it could be asymmetric, so the seven become one plus two times six. So it has a lot of terms, and you have to argue that a lot of them are zero, but if you apply his theorem, and correct some of the mistakes in it, then you end up with this here. Okay, so the sampling convergence we came up with, but this is not how the history went. The history went that people actually didn't even think about convergence. Cowan and Fox knew actually about Kallenberg theorem, and they wanted to model sparse graphs, and they realized that you could use the Kallenberg, that Aldous Hoover never gives you spot graphs. And they said, well, but I like exchangeability. So they used exchangeability for these random measures to come up with some kind of random graph, which is sparse, and it turns out to correspond to graph ones which are rank one. Okay, so they introduced that, they realized it so was- just the products of your features, not some non-trivial- Well, it's some function of the features. Yeah. And we will get to that if I get to it in, in sort of in the configuration model, but maybe I, I won't get to that. And then these guys introduce the notion of graphics are defined, and they didn't consider convergence. They're again sort of a just of a model of sparse graphs. And then obviously Jennifer and I with our history, when we, so they read this paper and we read the paper and we merely said graph limits, and they said, Exchangeability. So we came up first with this graph ones over sigma finite spaces, and then and the papers appeared within a month of each other, um, and both the students got really worried that the other group is sort of encroaching, and then we sort of all, well, we almost all put us together. The paper with Nina was already out, and Victor visited us and became an intern the next summer, and then we came up with this notion of sampling convergence to put this whole thing into a more systematic framework. So now let me tell you what the resulting, so I have until six or until when? You have another uh, 13, 14 minutes. Okay, so what is the resulting graph structure? Well, so if you are, if Jennifer was connected to Anton, okay, that means that this function must have been bigger than zero, okay? And actually it must have been, so let me look at Jennifer. Okay, so this is Jennifer. So this function must have been bigger than zero on a set of measure non-zero, because otherwise she would never have connected to Anton because it would have been measure zero that Anton appeared at this one point where Jennifer has connectivity. So in other words, once she connects, there is, as time goes on, there's more and more Poisson points, and from time to time, they will end up in the set where Jennifer is non-zero, so Jennifer will slowly over time develop infinite degree. In a similar way, me with my thousand students sort of on day five, now if day five becomes day 500, I will, since there is a T in front of the S, I will now get, have, have in, instead of a thousand student, I will have 100,000 students, right? So I will also grow, but these vertices, they stay leaves. They have no features attached to them. They have no way of- None of your students ever talk no. to anyone. Well, you see, at least these, you see that's- yeah, So this is sort of, these are all my students who were not successful. The other students eventually, actually, I turned out to be fine here too. But anyhow, so, so, so yes, so these are sort of, these vertices born here, they are themselves infertile, right? Whereas the feature vertices, they could be unfertile, but then you never see them. And if they're fertile, they're kept wrong. 
So you will see this core of high degree vertices joined by edges among each other by a graphon. Um, or think of these as Hollywood actors, okay? And then these are, and they are high degree stars of all the non actors who connect to them, but because they're non actors, they will never be on mo in movies together. And finally, they're sort of this lonely couples who are in love with each other but never connect to anybody else, which are the isolated edges. So this is the structure of these graphs. That is sort of what you get as the limit of sampling convergence as uh, time goes on. All these stars grow bigger and all this, the core gets denser and denser. So you get a dense core essentially and this object. Now, can we understand that if you don't know Kallenberg's theorem, is there some way we can understand it heuristically? Okay, so let me give you a heuristic picture. Okay, so we want to analyze this Poisson process on the vertex set. And originally, let's say we have m edges and we chose this probability so that the expected number of edges is constant. So now I will decompose the vertex set into what I call a core of vertices of degree square root of the number of edges. And then the low degree part, which is little o, and the big degree, which is omega. Okay, and then I sample with this probability, and so I get subsets here. I mean, there's some repetition because I have a Poisson process, but let's not worry about that for this heuristic picture. Um, so we get the sets left after sampling. Now, this set H, since there are only m many edges, you can't, you will have, or have, oh, here, this is the high degree part. There are just too few many who could be in there because otherwise you would have used up all your edges. So this has O of square root of m many vertices. So if I sample with this probability, there's nothing left. Okay, so this part will disappear. If the, now the, the core could contain that many vertices. If it does, you will never see it. But if, it's, if it has sort of theta of square root of m many vertices, then you will contain, it will contain p times this many vertices, so in expectation, order t vertices, and they have expected degree of this order. What happens to the, um, to the low degree vertices? Well, let's look at that. I claim that they actually will all be only have degree one after sampling. So let's look at one of these vertices and let's ask what's the probability that it has degree bigger or equal than two after sampling? Well, in order to have degree bigger or equal than two, I have here my vertex and has to have two neighbors. So there are d squared many choices, d choose two. So that is this d squared and actually, I have to be chosen, and these two possible neighbors have to be chosen, so that's a p to the power three. And now, we said that uh, the degree is little o of square root of m, so that gives this, okay? And now, p times uh, square root of m is sort of order t, so that's order one, so you get order p squared di is the probability, okay? And now, if I just sum over all of them, then I get order p squared by the sum of di. This is the sum of degrees, which is twice the number of edges, so that's m. And now, p was of order one over square root of m, p squared is over one over m, and there's a little o, so this is little o of one. So that means that all these low degree vertices after sampling actually have degree one. So this is sort of, so this sampling has this strange effect that after sampling, either you have degrees which grow with t, or you have degrees which just are order, not order one, but they're just one actually, okay? And so in the limit, the edges with two endpoints in this thing will have two endpoints with degree one, so they're isolated edges, and they will contribute to this guy. Um, then, the ones between this low degree and the core will be stars contributing to S, and those with both endpoints in the core will contribute to W. So this explains this picture, and I 
I will jump over that because I don't, I want to just talk one minute about the configuration model. So the configuration model is one where we can really look at all of this step by step and see what happens, okay? So if you've never, who has, who knows what the configuration model is? So most of you. So I just give you a sequence of degrees, n degrees. I consider them as little stumps with half edges, okay? And then I just randomly match the half edges. And since I might have five coming out and Jennifer might have six coming out, there's some chance that we actually got, get connected by two of them. So you get in general a multigraph, okay? And now one way to characterize this degree sequence is actually by the empirical degree distribution. So you just rescale the degrees by something not that important and then just put a measure there. So this gives you a random measure on the line. Um, and there are some, some properties which one of them is I have chosen my numbers in such a way that if I take a Poisson process of intensity T times rho on R plus, how many points do I get? Well, you have to integrate this and I just have done this in such a way that I get exactly the number of vertices I would get in sampling convergence. And Imagine who did this. Well, this um, I, will come, I hope that the theorem will have a name at it. Okay. It's together with two students. No. Uh, well, by now, by now there are two postdocs. Mm -hmm. Suvik, uh, so S. Dara. And. Shubaroto Sam. Remco and Andreas. So, um, so conditioned on this, these things are IID, but we have done it in such a way that we sort of just get these guys back, right? Because each vertex appears sort of the same number. I mean, it appears once here. So, and so here is now a theorem which says that assume that, well, I skipped over the side what, sample, what, what uniform tail regular means. This means there are not too many low degree vertices. Uh, which means that in the limit, if there's a limit, they won't, dis won't uh, contribute. So if you don't have too many low degree vertices, and so then you are sampling convergence if and only if this empirical degree distribution converges vaguely. Where vaguely means that if you integrate against a function with compact support, which is continuous, it should converge. Okay, and it turns out that the limit is now not a graph one because we have multigraphs. So you actually get sort of a random variable. So before we had a number between zero and one, which you could think of a random variable, which is either zero or one. Now you get a random variable in N for your multiple edges, which is a Poisson process. And so in other words, in distribution, the samples from this object converge to a random multigraph generated by first taking Poisson process of intensity t times rho, and then joining i and j with this many edges, okay? And um, I will sort of just jump over that. Essentially what happens is that um, if you think at what's the probability of joining sort of two sets s, s prime of half edges, but each of them has probability each pair has probability one over ln to connect to each other because that's many points there are. And then sort of it's very sparse and the limit theorem of sparse processes are Poisson processes, okay? And if you want to prove that, you eventually use Stein's methods and things like that. I will not go into the details. Um, so the distribution between edges and now if I look at these stumps here, this will then be a Poisson with this. And now I told you that this degree distribution is actually represented by these guys with the row n. So putting these together, you see that actually you will see sort of the di over square root of ln and the dj over square root of n, ln become yi times yj, and that explains this object. And, and finally, I will actually not show you theorem, but only say what happens if you now have low degree vertices. So recall this picture. 
and recall that a Poisson point yi corresponds to a sampled vertex with degree di equals z. And now what I will argue is that after sampling, the number of low degree half edges is proportional to this funny object. Once I do that, you will understand what's going on because then we have a times square root ln pieces in the low degrees, and now you can connect between the dense two parts, you get the w, you can connect between the degree of a vertex and one of any of the low degree vertices, this will give you the stars, or you can connect two low degree vertices and they will give you i. So the only thing I have to argue is that this has something to do with the low degrees. Well, this guy converges vaguely, okay? And it turns out that the integral of x times d rho n is one the way I've normalized things. So this measure has decaying tails. So the compactness at infinity I don't have to worry about. So if I did this interval from epsilon to infinity, then the vague convergence would just say this converges to zero for every epsilon. So the only thing which is, is left is the low degree vertices, and by my normalization, exactly so, which have little o of square root of ln many vertices, man at degree of that order. So a is actually that limit, so therefore you need sort of the conditions of the theorem, right? So you need way convergence to get sort of your convergence of the degrees of the core vertices, and the unit convergence of this object to get convergence of the fraction of low degree vertices, and then you get sort of all these Poisson processes by your matching process, and that's it. <laughs>